Hello and welcome, my friends and viewers, to this week's episode of Legend Lore, where I draw and talk about monsters, characters, gods, and other things from D&D 5th Edition, all while giving a small but quickly digestible history about them. Together we'll go over their history within the game, how they utilize them in the modern edition, and how you guys can utilize them in your own games. This week we will be covering Saravak Anchev, a warrior and son of the death god Baal, that rose to prominence due to his attempt to replace his father as the deity of murder. Saravak first appeared in 2nd edition, and is recorded as a 15th level chaotic evil fighter, depicted as a massive, muscled human with purple tattoos, glowing yellow eyes, and often seen wearing an enormous set of imposing spiked armor covered in blades. His most defining features were his helm, made in the shape of a fiend's open mouth, and a massive, custom-made plus two greatsword simply known as the Sword of Chaos. Saravak is recorded as being an extremely skilled warrior and strategist to match his imposing physicality, armed with a cunning intellect and a surprising charisma in the few moments that he chose to wield it. Saravak was also a Deathbringer, a group of master warriors trained under Ball, specializing in paralyzing intimidation and felling an opponent with a single blow. Saravak was naturally resistant to arcane magic, and capable of imposing said paralyzing fear upon his foes with just a look, both of which could come from his standing as a Baal spawn, the children of the god Baal, to which he split his soul apart in order to secure his resurrection should he ever be killed. Saravak's life goal was to usurp his father and achieve godhood as the new lord of murder. Having learned and researched his divine heritage as one of Baal's children, he believed that a great slaughter in Baal's name would build a path towards his ascension. As such, this resulted in him hunting other Baal spawn to remove the competition, and manipulating conflicts to result in great casualties and death, such as his orchestrating of a war between Baldur's Gate and the nation of Ammon. His plans, however, were ultimately thwarted when he was slain by Abdel Adrian, his half-brother and fellow Baal spawn who rejected his heritage and worked to prevent his siblings from usurping the title of Lord of Murder. His story didn't end here, however, as while he toiled in the depths of the demonic abyss, Saravak met his brother a second time, where they formed a pact so Saravak could aid Adrian in killing another female ball spawn named Melisan in exchange for Saravak's escaping of the abyss and return to the land of the living. They ultimately were successful, and Saravak was given a second chance, but it was ultimately hollow and pathetic compared to the divine power that was snatched right out of his fingers. Saravak spent the rest of his life in drink and despair, until Baal returned to provide him with a new purpose once again, this time as the head of his growing murderous cult. In terms of Saravak's relationships with other people, he was romantically involved with a warrior from Karaturin named Tamaka, the relationship being one of true love but suffering due to Saravak's obsession with becoming the next Lord of Murder. Believing that it was actually impossible for a mortal to ascend to godhood, or simply wishing to not lose him to divinity, Tamako left and Saravak ended up taking another lover in Synthandria, a vain woman who cared only for the power and wealth that being Saravak's lover would offer her. Saravak also cultivated a massive following of ball worshippers due to his status as his son, such as a wizard confidant named Korlaz, his mentor Winsky Peririt, I hope I pronounced that correctly, the leader of the Black Talon's mercenary company, Tazak, a power-hungry member of the Flaming Fist named Angelo Dizan, and a secretive conjurer known only as Samaj. Then there's his relationship with Abdel Adrian, a bitter hatred born from Adrian slaying a Saravak to stop his ascension, and furthered by Abdel's role in resurrecting Saravak to an empty life with no purpose. I can always imagine these two hunting and battling against one another throughout the ages and timelines of D&D, one embracing his role as scion to the god of murder while the other seeks to carve his own path and prevent destruction from availing. When it comes to playing Saravok at the table, it can be tempting to present him as a large brute with spiked armor and a giant sword, especially given his traditional visage. But one must remember that Saravok is a scion of Baal, the rogue of the Dead Three, which were the three gods that confronted Jurgal and each gained a piece of divinity, with Bane serving as the fighter and Mercul sort of serving as its mage, if we're basing it off of the classic triad of archetypes. Saravok might be a warrior rather than an assassin, but he carries an assassin's cunning, ruthlessness, and utter lack of mercy or compassion. He is trained so his strikes can take down enemies in one hit, and while he may revel in the death and bloodshed that he causes, he will always approach every battle strategically, conducting himself without remorse or concern for the foolish concept of honor or fairness. Based on his backstory, I would personally recommend playing Saravok similar to Slade or Deathstroke from the original Teen Titans cartoon, physically imposing and well-trained, but a mastermind with plans and ambition greater than that of a common mercenary or sellsword. He intends to become the new god of murder. You can't be a fool or hot-headed if you intend to succeed at such a cosmic endeavor. So play him smart and play him deadly. Have him develop multi-layered plans and strategies that can follow the plans of the players. And every once in a while, give him a single swing kill to an NPC or a PC that sends the message this guy is dangerous and to battle him is a great risk. In terms of his interaction with the party, perhaps he could have that Robin and Slade mentor-apprentice relationship from the cartoon with one of the PCs, always in the shadows and acting as a pseudo-teacher while also fulfilling the role of the villain. 
Saravak would also never be caught acting alone, recruiting a party of like-minded characters to his cause using his charisma and his physical might. This can form a sort of anti-party for your own players, dark reflections or even complete opposites meant to challenge them both roleplay and combat-wise. If you do go this route, make sure to think on how you want to challenge the players and present these opposites. Are you going to have your PC life cleric show down against a death cleric, or are you going to have the barbarian face the damage staunching, stun locking wrath of a monk in Saravok's employ? All this is to say that Saravok would not be encountered as just a common mercenary or in service to others like, say, Warduke. He runs his own crew of deadly, eclectic killers, with the goal of either assuming Ball's position as a god of murder or serving him as the current devotee with aspirations to achieve divinity on his own. Now, when it comes to running Saravok in combat, there is actually already a very well-made stat block for him in page 124 of Minsk and Boo's Journal of Villainy, which I've linked in the description below. As such, I'll be going over the most efficient ways to use Saravok in combat using this stat block. As a CR15, players will need to have entered into at least third tier play to be able to fight him on equal footing, but I would definitely recommend introducing him to the party at lower levels, in order to show his strength, maybe even kill off an NPC that the players align with who they believed was extremely powerful. Saravok has an armor class of 21, magic resistance, an average of about 120 hit points, immunity to poison damage, and is unable to be frightened, charmed, or poisoned. This offers him great staying power against some of the most common conditions in the game, and his rejuvenation ability means that even if he loses the battle and is slain by the players, as long as his temple to Ball is active, be it under Baldur's Gate or wherever else you want to put it in your world, he can keep coming back with more and more specialized forces made to counter the party's strengths and exploit their weaknesses. The Saravok spell list is great and varied, but if your party has counterspell, most of his actions are going to be wasted if he attempts to cast most of them. So my advice is to cut down this chunky spell list into just the following. Divination, Animate Dead, Dispel Magic, Harm, Guardian of Faith, and Spiritual Weapon. Starting with Divination, it is purely an out of combat use spell, allowing him to learn about his enemies and form strategies around the information that he collects. Animate Dead, however, will give him some numbers and support should he wish to even the fight, but be sure to cast it before the party gets there lest they counterspell it right out the gate and eat up his action. They could always end it with the Dispel Magic, but that will still require them to use their action first. And speaking of Dispel Magic, it is definitely useful for spells such as Spiritual Weapon or any other annoying concentration effects like Flaming Sphere or Armor of Agathus. Then there's Harm, which is a great spell to open combat with, both for its damage output and the cool factor that comes with a player possibly dispelling or counterspelling it at the start of combat, making them feel awesome for saving their party from a great deal of damage. Guardian of Faith offers some additional damage and protection for Saravok, so long as he casts it pre-combat and lures the party into the triggering space. If he positions himself in a small enough room to battle the party, they can suffer the Guardian's damage each turn, but that does come with its own risks, such as being blasted apart by Fireball in such a small space. And lastly, Spiritual Weapon is another spell that's great to cast pre-combat, opening up his turn with the ghostly weapon piercing into one of the party from an unseen location, before he capitalizes on it with his Sword of Chaos. For his regular actions, Saravok may cast one spell and make a single attack if he wishes, but if you're not keen on making use of most of his spells and relying more so on his fighting capability, I would recommend making two or three attacks with multi-attack depending on the party's strength. His sword has an additional effect of forcing anyone who's damaged by it to make a DC 16 constitution save or be cursed to be unable to regain hit points, which can only be removed via remove curse or some other similar effect. It does not go away with a long rest. This is absolutely huge in alienating healers such as clerics or paladins, which now allows them to be a little bit more liberal with their spellcasting since healing spells such as cure wounds and heal are going to end up being useless. This way they can end spells with dispel magic or shoot up more guiding bolts or whatever. His additional effect of Assassin Strike allows him to deal an additional 66 slashing damage if he has advantage on the triggering attack, so definitely give him some goons or have him raise some undead to flank with in order to greatly increase his damage output. And then lastly there are his legendary actions, which consist of making a single attack with a sword, the ability to cast a cantrip, and channel Ball's Hate, which causes a target within 30 feet to be unable to regain hit points until Saravok's next turn. This ability has no save to resist it, nor can it be counterspelled, and Saravok doesn't need to see the target to cast it, as it can surpass any barrier, even things like Wall of Force. Overall, despite the strength of 5e players, Saravok is a particularly deadly opponent, mostly due to his passive healing negation and sheer damage output if he has allies to flank with. Canonically, the Sword of Chaos is capable of stealing life from his opponents, but I do believe that might make the fight a little too difficult. As for players, telling you how to fight him would undo all the work that I've just done for the Dungeon Masters, so I wish you good fortune in the wars to come. Now, on the off chance your players wish to align with Saravok, he would make for an excellent quest giver, predominantly dealing with death and destruction. The players could be sent on assassination missions to kill nobles, generals, or other people that he needs out of the way, engage in strategic battles and head charges to take key points in an ongoing conflict, or acquire especially powerful magic items for him and his army to make use of, especially if they're ballish in nature. 
On the opposite end, however, Abdel Adrian could recruit the party to aid him in tracking down Saravok, should your game take place before their fateful battle. Furthermore, any noble or general could hire the party to take charge against a group of deadly warriors that have been massacring their forces, only to learn that Saravok commands the other side with an iron fist and a great mind for warfare. The players then have a choice to make. Do they risk the wrath of Baal and his spawn, or do they walk away for another foolish hero to take the deed? In terms of items that Saravok could reward the players with, or items that the players could find in saravok controlled factions upon their defeat, I would recommend things like armor and weaponry, especially those related to both the conflict and the environment of the area that they're found in. If Saravok mercenaries are held up in an acidic swamp, it makes sense for the commander of that company to be wearing an acid-resistant black dragon scale mail. If the party has a dex-based rogue or fighter, Saravok could give them a scimitar of speed as a reward for bringing them the head of a general who has been a thorn in his side for months in a war campaign. The items listed below are further examples of what I would personally recommend looking into, but so long as it helps them kill faster, grow stronger, and survive longer, I'm sure Saravok would approve of it. And lastly, for our magic item this video, we have the Sword of Chaos, at least my version of it. This plus one greatsword requires attunement, and gets a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls made with it, and deals an additional 1d6 necrotic damage on a successful hit. The sword is considered a plus two greatsword against a target that is below their maximum hit points, and a plus three greatsword against a target that has less than half their maximum hit points. Furthermore, on a successful hit, the wielder gains temporary hit points equal to the amount of necrotic damage they dealt with that hit. These temporary hit points stack on one another, with the maximum amount that a wielder can have being equal to their character level, lasting until the wielder's next short rest, at which they are dispelled. And then lastly, once per short rest, upon making a successful attack against a creature, you can force that creature to make a DC 15 constitution saving throw, or be unable to regain hit points until the end of their next long rest. This is a sword that gets better at killing the lower hit points that your enemies have, so I'm definitely sure that your fighter or rogue or any other high melee damage dealer would definitely approve of it. I've included the item stat block in the description below, and with that, that's Saravak Anchev, everybody. I want to thank all of you guys for watching, and if you guys enjoyed this video, please like, share, comment, and subscribe, and press the little bell icon to be notified of future videos. If you guys want to vote on future subjects, there is a link in the description that can take you to the polls, which go active every Sunday at the same time that I upload. In the comments, let me know what you guys think about Saravok, if you've used him in your games, what kind of books or games you've played that have included him in them, and also what other things you guys would like to see in upcoming videos. But until then, I'll see you guys next time.